Okay, I have never seen such a punctual crowd. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. I hope you've all had a chance to have some tea and coffee and um, a little bit of conversation, a bit of networking, and there will be opportunity after this event as well for people to stick around. Um, it's nice to have so many experts in the one room. Um, so uh, I suppose my task firstly is to introduce um, you all uh, to our panel, of course, and also to the Counter Extremism Project. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you here on behalf of the Counter Extremism po Project, or CEP, uh, as we're more generally known. known. Um, CEP is an independent, non-partisan, not-for-profit international policy organization, uh, which works to combat um, the threat posed by extremist ideologies and terrorism. Um, CEP has been very actively engaged and involved in the policy discussions around extremism um, in the UK since 2015, uh, when we were uh, effectively established here. Um, and I suppose our MO has been to share our knowledge, uh, our research, um, and we have a very vast bank of, of research um, available, which you can check out on our website. Uh, and of course, sharing um, our insights and policy recommendations uh, with policymakers uh, and law enforcement agencies um, here in the UK, as well as um, uh, in the US, uh, across the rest of Europe, and indeed in, in many other parts of the world. Um, I'm delighted to say that this is our first in-person public policy event in the UK since um, the pandemic. Um, so it's really great to be back um, meeting like this in person and uh, I hope uh, and I'm confident we will have a really fruitful exchange of views um, as, as the afternoon, afternoon goes on. Um, we're really pleased um, in particular to host this event, um, uh, teasing out the recommendations uh, of the Prevent Review, um, which of course, as all of you uh, will very well know, is a comprehensive assessment of one of the uh, key strands of the UK's uh, counterterrorism strategy contest. And uh, of course, uh, the objective of PREVENT is to, is to stop people becoming violent extremists. And that is very much in sync with our objective as an organization. So um, we, CEP, with our experts here in the UK, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, have uh, fed into that process um, and have followed it very closely and uh, are really pleased to host this discussion today. Um, so the panel that we have assembled, I think you'll agree, um, is a really good one. Um, and we will discuss, um, prevent uh, the review, its implementation, the challenge of com combating terrorism in a liberal democracy. Um, and we'll hopefully look forward and assess um, the evolving terror threat uh, here in the UK and explore ways in which we can enhance the effectiveness of the prevent strategy in addressing uh, ide ideologically motivated offending. So um, on that note, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, as I said, an excellent panel, uh, all of whom I'm sure are known to most of you. Um, Sir John Jenkins, firstly, John, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, John uh, is a senior fellow at Policy Exchange. Um, many will be familiar with his 35 year career in the British diplomatic service, where he lived and worked in several countries in the Middle East, as well as um, subsequently becoming the lead author of the British government's uh, Muslim Brotherhood Review in 2014. Liam Duffy, uh, my friend and colleague at CEP, uh, is uh, one of our strategic advisors. Uh, friends most of the time at least. Um, he's written extensively on extremism and counterterrorism uh, for many uh, respected publications, including The New Statesman, uh, Spectator, The Telegraph, The Express, and Unheard, amongst others. And he is the author of CEP's report, Western Foreign Fighters and the Yazidi Genocide, which if you haven't seen, I'd really strongly recommend that you take a look at. Um, Dr. Julia Ryshenko, um, again, Julia, thank you for joining us. Uh, she is a consultant at um, United Nations and International Organization, the United Na Nations International Organization of M Migration. She has, amongst other things, worked with NATO on the development of policy and capacity building, and her expertise focuses on the importance of integrating 
a gender lens into both prevent, prevention of violent extremism and rehabilitation programs. Um, so a very interesting uh, perspective that we're looking forward to hearing. And finally, um, uh, again, my friend and colleague, um, senior advisor to the Counter Extremism Project here uh, in the UK. Um, Ian has a very long and distinguished career uh, in prison security and counterterrorism, uh, from being a former prison governor to leading an independent review of Islamist extremism in prisons and the probation service in the UK. So um, I think uh, a great lineup. Uh, looking forward to a, a really interesting discussion. We're going to kick off with introductory remarks from each of our panelists, uh, starting with Ian, who's going to set the scene for us, and then we'll get into a panel discussion and look forward to hearing from you from the floor as well. So. Ian, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'm probably the only panellist who's going to be using a lectern, and I think that's an account of the fact I'm on very strong antihistamines at the minute. If anybody's suffering from hay fever, hopefully you'll have sympathy for me, and it's, it's uh, keeping me upright. Um, I, I'm here today to set the scene with a few remarks about my area of expertise, uh, such as it is, which is violent extremism in prisons. Uh, and um, there are three issues that uh, relate to the Shawcross Review and the challenges ahead, not least the challenges of keeping politicians uh, focused on getting recommendations off the page and into reality in the run-up to a general election and with lots of other competing priorities as well. So uh, nowhere is that challenge more uh, acute and urgent uh, than it is in uh, our prisons, which are currently holding just to give you some scale of the problem, about 220 uh, terrorist-connected offenders, that, that, that is, people who've been imprisoned under various uh, terrorism legislation. And uh, although this, this uh, number is uh, subject to conjecture, at any one time, according to the, the data that I've seen, there are about 1,000 people also in prison in a population of about 86,000 um, who are uh, believed to be at risk of being drawn into violent extremism which, of course, is, is the other threat as well. So um, in relation to prevent um, prisons, what we are looking at are those at risk of becoming ideologically motivated uh, while inside uh, in terms of uh, violent offending and uh, obviously prevent as it relates to the desistance and disengagement of terrorist prisoners as they leave custody and enter the community. So those are the two areas that I want to try to focus on but there's a third area as well, if I have time at the end. Um, as a raconteur, I'm rather long-winded sometimes, I'm told, but I'm going to canter through this and look to Lucinda to allow me to talk maybe about the third thing, which is to step back from the, the prevent uh, review and the prevent strategy and uh, maybe say a few words about uh, the examining of its sufficiency within our overall uh, contest strategy, which is the UK's national counterterrorism uh, strategy. So... Um, Shawcross's specific recommendation that I want to talk about today within the review that relates to prison is recommendation 27. I'm just going to read it to you. And that is uh, that uh, to review prevent-related staffing and training in prisons, to seek to increase expertise and skills with regard to understanding the ideological drivers and theological elements of radicalisation, uh, Her Majesty's, sorry, His Majesty's Prison and Probation Service must adopt a precautionary policy when assessing the risk of ideologically motivated offenders. So spotting, reporting, and challenging uh, behavior that tends to be a national security risk is very hard at the best of times. And I'm afraid to tell you that this is not the best of times in relation to how our prisons are operating. And you don't need to take my word for it. Uh, you can, for example, uh, listen to Her His Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons. Uh, I want to read you a, a couple of statements that uh, the Chief Inspector of Prisons, Charlie Taylor, made recently, uh, without any context uh, for the moment. So on one prison, uh, there is no better sign of decline in a prison than a lack of cleanliness. And here the wings were the dirtiest I have ever seen since I became Chief Inspector. Floors, walls, serveries were filthy, rubbish was everywhere, and bins were overflowing. On another uh, prison. He says, the rate of staff assaults was the highest amongst comparable prisons and had risen. Many prisoners and staff told us that they felt that prisoners' growing frustration 
was driving much of the violence in the prison, particularly assaults on staff. Now you might say, well, what do these comments have anything to do with violent extremism in prison, the prevent review and what we need to do to tackle it? Well, those remarks were made respectively about HMP uh, Whitemore and HMP Long Larton, which are two of our high security prisons who collectively hold a very significant amount of our national security risk. And uh, they have uh, significant numbers of terrorism connected offenders inside uh, with access to and associating with other highly dangerous offenders. Now the point I'm trying to make here is very plain and I hope you, you get it. And I suppose it, it kind of speaks to the broken window theory, if any of you are familiar with that in criminological terms. And that is if you're in a high security prison uh, where uh, inadequate numbers and a battered front line of staff is buckling under the amount of violence and you can't even empty the bins. What hope, realistically, is there for skilling up people to do the very sophisticated and fraught job of spotting and challenging and combating uh, violent extremism in prisons? I think it's a, it's a spectacularly large uh, challenge. Now, in fact, some of you might be surprised to know that th that, that challenge has a statutory footing and has had so since... 2015 under section 26 of the Counterterrorism Security Act of that year. And that is that prison governors must pay due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into uh, terrorism. Well, I, I found in 2015 when I led an independent review of Islamist extremism in prisons and Jonathan Hall QC, who's the government's independent um, uh, commentator on ter the Terrorism Act, also found five years later in 2020 that that was aspirational at best. Um, and actually I find the, um, the convergence between what I was saying in 2015 and what he was saying only three years ago to be rather chilling and rather disturbing because uh, he was saying quite clearly again that staff did not have the competence and some staff, uh, including prison imams for example, did not have the will to oppose violent extremism and poisonous sectarian ideas that were being propagated inside prisons. But this is a problem, of course, that extends throughout the, the, the spectrum of uh, ideologically motivated offenders in custody. And just to go back to that point, about 66%, I believe, of the offenders in custody uh, are, uh, who are terrorists have committed offences related to Islamist extremism, and 26% have uh, committed offences related to neo-Nazi, far-right, uh, fascist uh, extremism. So the locus of the threat still in prisons and outside in terms of its lethality and scale is Islamist extremism. But we mustn't forget that terrorists learn from each other. And what's happening in prisons in relation to lots of things that have been said about the disorder inside and about uh, gangs operating to push away legitimate authority and establish uh, the, their own regimes and so on. Um, if that's happening as a result of Islamist extremism, which I believe it is, it will certainly happen in relation to uh, extreme right-wing uh, terrorism as well as those numbers grow. So the, the challenge is immense, uh, basically, to, um, to deal with this problem. I'm not going to try to under, underplay it. Prisons are ideal incubators of violent extremism. You've got a ready supply of violent, credulous young men who are sometimes imprisoned in our high security state for long periods of time. Uh, and who are searching for meaning, and they're entering an environment which is endemically unstable because it is uh, often overcrowded. There are inadequate numbers of staff there. Staff don't have the confidence to be clearly in charge of the environment that they're in, and prison governors have insidious jobs trying to balance uh, what might be perceived to be uh, concessions to prisoners in order to get from one end of the day to another without having a, a, a violent incident. Um, so, what about managing the risk of those uh, prisoners who are going through the gate? We've just talked about um, those who are uh, incarcerated. So, one of the lesser known purposes of the uh, prevent strategy is in relation to convicted terrorists, and that's to stop them uh, becoming re-engaged in violent extremism. And uh, Shawcross recommended that the doctrine and training of the people who were involved and that the practitioners was, was re-examined fundamentally. Uh, why was that? Well, there, uh, the current desistance and disengagement program, which is the program that is used in effect to stop people becoming re-engaged in violent extremism, was seen by him, and I agree with him, as being flawed in 
possibly three particular ways. One that was too generic. Um, what we have here are a host of, unfortunately, heterogeneous offenders. So we've got everybody from you know, two-time losers to university graduates who are committing ideologically motivated violence and a whole spectrum in between. Um, and we have generic psychosocial, I would call them sheep dip, responses to their needs. When actually what we need to do is spend a lot more money looking at their trajectory into violent extremism to figure out what to do uh, in an individualized way to help them leave violent extremism, which is much more uh, complex. Secondly, and I think Shawcross touched on this, we've got to look at the doctrine uh, which governs how practitioners relate to uh, their, their subjects, to how therapists relate to people who are being um, uh, under their uh, supervision in terms of uh, tackling their offending behavior and their, their violent extremism. So um, I believe, and I think this is echoed by Sean Cross, that there is too much of an affirmatory approach to this. There's too much of a collusive approach. And some of these affirmatory and collusive approaches are very um, common in other offending behavior programs that relate to, let's say, crime that isn't ideologically motivated. I don't think those approaches are suitable. And I think, and it, you know, uh, Prison Service agrees and the Ministry of Justice agrees with me and Shaw Cross, there needs to be a fundamental review of that approach. Um, not simply because, unfortunately, we have had, in relation to uh, terrorist prisoners and extremist suspects who've come into contact with the prevent strategy, quite a few situations where um, they've, uh, the offender has played the game or the suspect has played the game, pulled the wool over the eyes of the uh, practitioner and then gone on as we know, to commit very serious terrorist offences. I'm thinking of, for example, the murder of Sir David Amies, where the subject was uh, subject to prevent review before and said in court, uh, mm -hmm. Sir David Amies' murder, that he just said basically what you know, people wanted to, him to hear in order to be let go and to be able to go on and uh, commit his offences. <coughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I think I'm going to leave... Uh, it there, except to, to say one final thing, and that is uh, what I said I was going to do at the start, and that is take a step back from uh, the prevent strategy. Uh, what we are in danger of having is a prevent strategy that is overwhelmed by trivial uh, referrals and also by a concept, the concept of safeguarding, whereas Shawcross agree, uh, says, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, we need to focus on the harm. But that probably leaves some in our national counterterrorism strategy, a missing piece of the jigsaw. And that's the bit, I think, that happens before prevent. And it's not a securitized response to violent extremism. And I've called that the, the suite of uh, Ps in prevent, which most of you will know, which is uh, prevent, prepare, protect, and pursue needs another P, and that's called promote. And hopefully I'll get a chance to speak about that later. But that is a whole of society approach to being able to drive out violent extremism for communities where it incubates. But hopefully more of that later. I'll leave it for now. Thanks. Abs Absolutely. Thanks a lot, um, Ian. And uh, you've raised a whole lot of issues that I think we'll get into um, as the discussion goes on. Um, next, I might ask you, John, um, if, if, if you're happy to, to share your uh, introductory thoughts. And uh, we'll move on then to... Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Lucinda. Um, <coughs> I'm not a practitioner. Um, I am a former diplomat. Um, uh, I have enormous respect, actually, for those who do um, uh, uh, act as practitioners in the prevent sphere, both in prisons and more widely. I think it's, <coughs> it's an enormously uh, tough ask of people, not just in terms <coughs> of the workload, but also in terms of the emotional and other strain uh, it puts on you. Um, so and I, I, I know it's something that I myself um, would lack the patience uh, to do. Um, so I admire anybody who does do it. Um, uh, but I spent 40 years um, uh, on and off, mostly on, in, uh, in Muslim uh, countries, uh, living and working, dealing with Muslim governments, dealing with ordinary uh, people, dealing with uh, NGOs, societal organizations, and so forth. 
<coughs> and this issue, the issue that's always concerned me, which is essentially the issue of ideology, uh, and what do you do about an ideology that purposefully sets out to subvert and in the end destroy uh, the existing political order? Uh, what do you do about this in the Western context? And I, I, I describe it in this way because that's how Middle Eastern governments have understood the threat um, for the last 40 years. Not just Middle Eastern governments, you find the same, the same sense uh, of, the, of the challenge from organized uh, Islamist uh, ideology, uh, both those that, that, that espouse and those that don't espouse violence as a path to power um, or as a primary path to power. Uh, this, uh, it's the same sort of framing. Um, and for them, of course, within the, um, uh, the, the context of, uh, uh, of Islamic legitimacy, which most of these states rely on, uh, they frame this as fitna. Fitna in, in Arabic means different things. It comes from a root actually meaning enchantment. Um, but it, in this context, it means what we used to call sedition. But we, should, we don't call sedition anymore. I think the Sedition Act is still in the books, actually, uh, from 1900-something, 1905, um, but has fallen into, into disuse. And it, it, it's very difficult for Western governments um, uh, even to apply the concept. Um, and it's interesting, if you, if you, when I think about my experience uh, in the Middle East, uh, dealing with these sort of issues over the last 40 years, seeing it, uh, the, 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 the challenge uh, morph from something the government saw as a sort of a, a cloud the size of a man's hand in the 1970s, 1980s, to something which you now is one of the main concerns for all governments in the Middle East, including those that we have traditionally thought of as sympathetic to Islamism. Uh, I mean, Islamism, you can talk about what Islamism actually means. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very wide issue. So, for example, uh, the Emirates in the, 19, in the 1980s was very sympathetic to various forms of Islamism, particularly Brotherhood-related Islamism, um, which were coming out of the Northern Emirates. They are deeply unsympathetic to it now. Um, see it in Saudi Arabia as well. Um, and what it's interesting with the Saudi experience, because Saudi saw perhaps the biggest morphing of Islamism from a sort of rigorous brotherhood uh, approach um, uh, mixed with, with other more marginal approaches in the 1980s to something that became thoroughly Salafized um, uh, by, the, uh, by the late 90s, early 2000s. And this, of course, is, 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 is the process that gave rise to Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and ultimately to uh, Daesh, to the Islamic State. Uh, and its, uh, its offshoots. Islamism is a constantly metastasizing, constantly morphing uh, phenomenon, but there are certain basic principles. Uh, one, one is that it is actually thoroughly modernist in the sense that it, it, it's a political project that seeks to take control of, a, of, a, of, a, of national states in the interest of a supranational community. Uh, and the second is that it privileges uh, 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 revelation, particularly law based in revelation, over law uh, discovered by reason um, or, or, by, uh, or by secular political processes. This is a challenge uh, that uh, we face in the West, and Islamism in the West is actually increasingly distinct from Islamism uh, in, the, uh, in the heartlands of the Middle East uh, for various reasons, um, uh, interesting reasons, which we could go into, but it, it, it's too long to do it now. Um, when I was asked to do the Muslim Brotherhood Review uh, by David Cameron in 2014, uh, one of the things that he talked about was British values. If you look at the extremism strategy, this, of course, is something that's also in the extremism strategy where people say that extremism is something that is essentially hostile, fundamental British values. I said to him at the time, what do you mean by British values? Because when I think about what people uh, think about marriage, about the status of women, about, uh, about, uh, about sexuality and so forth now, they're very different from what people thought about 25, 30, 40 years ago. Values themselves change. The most, uh, the most impressive model uh, in, in Europe, for me, in addressing the ideological challenge um, of Islamism and other forms of extremism to the constitutional or political order, the existing political order, um, is, is Germany. Um, uh, and that's because Germany had, uh, uh, had a Stunde Null, it had a zero hour after 1945, when everything was reconstructed. And they wrote a new constitution. And the new constitution, the Grundgesetz, uh, dates from 1949. It was written by a collection of very um, uh, 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 prominent German jurists. And if you look at it, it sets out a, a set of fundamental beliefs and fundamental values and fundamental rights, which are, which are essential, which underpin Germany as a constitutional state, as a constitutional order. Uh, and if you don't agree with these rights, uh, what, uh, what the consequence of that is that the German domestic um, uh, uh, intelligence and security agency, the equivalent of our security service, uh, the uh, uh, the Verfassungsschutz, uh, 
uh, the Constitutional Protection Agency, will say that you are an enemy of the Constitution, or what you are doing is inimical to the Constitution. They use these exact words in German, Verfassungsfeindlich or Verfassungsfeinde. Um, this is not something, and that of course is based in, and what this does is give the intelligence agencies um, uh, the right to monitor uh, and report publicly, all this is done publicly, uh, on these organizations, and they stretch from the Islamism, uh, from Islamism through to the extreme left and the extreme right. This is not just about, about a, particular, a particular ethnicity or a particular religion. But all these, 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 these beliefs and these ideologies in, uh, in Germany represent a, uh, a definable threat to the constitutional order. This is not something that happens here because of the way in which the British constitution has evolved over the years from the 17th century onwards. We do not have something which we can point to and say this is what it means to be a citizen of this constitutional state and a member of this constitutional order. And I think that is a real problem. The French do it a different way. The French, uh, uh, and this again derives from the particular history that the French have um, of laicite, which emerged uh, essentially out of the, the conflicts in the 19th century between uh, Republicans, the heirs of the revolution, and, uh, uh, and, and the church, which culminated in, in, in an uneasy truce in the early 1900s, which established a basis for interaction. This is why you see the sort of things that the French government, Macron and others, uh, are trying to do in terms of challenging in the public space, um, uh, not just Islamist ideology, but funding to Islamist organizations. Um, and the funding issue is important because one of the other things I said to Cameron at the time, if you want to do something serious about this, you follow the money, which will require, of course, resources. So if you want to do all of these things, and I, and I, I understand the risks. I mean, I'm not saying this because I, I want a deep surveillance state uh, in the sort, of the sort we, see, we see in the Middle East. <coughs> but I do think... But this, is, this relates to, to, to Karl Popper's paradox about, about tolerance, that, 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 that toleration has its limits, that a tolerant system cannot tolerate something that seeks its own abolition, seeks, seeks to abolish the, the state, which is a version of Wittgenstein's game theory, that a game is essentially the rules of the game. Once the rules change, it's not that game anymore. <coughs> and I think this is a challenge that governments uh, in Europe um, have, uh, have tried to address uh, and have actually failed to address. And one of the consequences of this is you end up with situations like in Batley or Wakefield where you essentially see the creation of little zones of what, of what Said Qutb, one of the chief ideologues of, 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 the, of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, called Tamkeen, which is the creation of, uh, of an enabling space. Uh, used to, the question you used to... Uh, two, two, 30 seconds? Yeah. The question you used to ask Muslim Brothers was, was, are you on the road to Mecca or on the road to Medina? Because that told you whether you were you were heading, you, you were trying to, to, to create a community within a community, or whether you were trying to take over a political community as a whole. Uh, it's a question they don't like being asked, but it is a fundamental question. Um, and this is something, so you see the way, way, so when you have, you know, the essential creation of zones in which you can't talk about the prophet, or you can't show, you can't show uh, uh, illustrations or pictures of the prophet, or, or, or other things that are, that, are, that, are, that are claimed to be uh, uh, inviolable and sacred, <coughs> not pictorial you are essentially surrendering, and these things are entirely legal in this country, or in Germany, or in France, or indeed in the United States. We've had the same at, at, at various uh, universities in the United States. You are essentially ceding ground, and I think this is fundamentally dangerous. I don't underestimate the challenge of doing something about this, uh, given the state of, of British, we need Western politics, uh, and the, the, the contestatory nature of any issue to do with, with, with fundamental freedoms and fundamental rights. But I do think it's an issue that you can't simply avoid. And I suppose that goes to the very um, core of what we're looking at today, which is how you balance rights and freedoms yes. in a liberal democracy with you know, the objective of keeping people safe. So um, we will come back to that. Um, Julia, please. Oh, yeah, perfect. Of course, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Okay, is this one on? This one on? Yeah, it's on. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the Conjure Extremism Project, and uh, thanks, uh, Lucinda, for the introduction previously. So I'll approach, I'll try approaching the issue from a slightly different perspective. And uh, so um, my former background is academic, and in the past few years I've done a lot of work on domestic affairs related to violent extremism in the UK. But in the past few years, I've mostly been working with the United Nations and other international organizations um, in different parts of the world with a focus on the MENA region. So 
the Middle East, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, working on national security, combating terrorism, organized crime, and uh, working on gender as well. So uh, one of the aspects that I've noticed, most of the projects that I worked on have a very strong focus and a requirement set by Western donors to integrate a gender lens or a gender perspective in all the cycles of the programs, uh, terrorism prevention, starting from the design, delivery, implementation, as well as monitoring and evaluation strategies. So there is a very strong incentive and as well as a requirement to get the funding is actually to ensure that first of all women are represented, second that a gender perspective is represented in the debates on, uh, in the analysis and debates on national security and prevention uh, of terrorism. Now we know of course from uh, those of you who are practitioners or as well as policy makers, uh, we all know that uh, terrorism is uh, closely linked to gender perspectives and uh, that is quite uh, visible from certain terrorist ideologies and uh, it's apparent in uh, violent uh, extremist narratives, especially the ones related to Islamism. And uh, well, I won't go into the stereotypical depiction now, but it's quite often that we see that quite uh, uh, distinct portrayal of distinct roles and uh, I would say tasks for men and women. And men are very often in terrorist narratives are portrayed as heroic, courageous, uh, primary actors that are dominant. They are responsible for armed um, struggle, resistance. Women are perceived or portrayed as more secondary actors that are there to help, to support morally fighters. Now we've seen, of course, on the ground, it's not always like that. Women do assume active roles, so we shouldn't always uh, believe those narratives, but nevertheless, that's the, that's the gender ideological framework. Now, these narratives, of course, are linked to cultural ideas of uh, masculinities and femininities, but as well, what's important, they tap into certain gender-specific needs and challenges uh, that are, that are cultural specific, culture-specific, context-specific, uh, as well as, uh, well, the needs that, for instance, uh, what are those needs? Can be protection, empowerment, status, and so on. Now, of course, uh, when the PREVENT review was published, even though now I'm mostly working on international affairs in a different part of the world, However, as a, an academic and a practitioner, for me, of course, it was very interesting to what extent is gender represented in that review. And uh, it was uh, quite interesting that, of course, uh, my colleagues just mentioned a few aspects that were highlighted or not highlighted in the review. Now, uh, definitely, it looks at a number of recommendations, as well as, uh, for instance, the idea that ideology should be, uh, ideology is often overlooked and should be paid. There should be more attention to ideology as opposed to maybe vulnerabilities that are personality specific or um, some psychosocial, socioeconomic inequalities. Now, I agree with this point. Uh, however, uh, one aspect that surprised me as a gender expert is that uh, the gender dimension has also been overlooked. Not just the idea of ideology and the representation of the ideology, but also the gender aspect. Uh, it is unclear to what extent, and I guess with this I would like to open up later a discussion uh, and I have a few questions to practitioners. We have some practitioners and the prevent um, officers here in the, in the audience. Uh, it's, it is unclear to what extent gender dimension is represented in the current risk assessment processes, uh, referrals, and analytical work related to the prevent stream, uh, particularly when it comes to flagging those indicators that are, well, early warnings or early indicators of radicalization. Um, I also haven't seen any gender disaggregated data, which, is, which could be quite important for the further analysis and the interpretation of the findings for monitoring for evaluation strategies. Now, uh, as a, I would say, as a, as a, to wrap it up as a conclusion and summary uh, of what I just said, uh, since our event is dedicated to the question of how do we enhance the effectiveness of the current strategies uh, regarding prevention of uh, extremism, I would suggest the following aspects. Uh, so first of all, uh, gender sensitive um, risk assessments. Uh, to ensure that risk assessments carried out under the prevent stream are actually 
uh, considering gender-specific needs, vulnerabilities, not just vulnerabilities in a psychosocial sense of that word, but as well as lots of diverse needs that are gender-specific. Uh, that includes recognizing how norms, roles, or expectations uh, may possibly intersect with other factors, such as it could be social class, could be uh, any experiences of perceived or actual discrimination or exclusion, so that intersectional approach that is quite popular now in um, academia and uh, feminist research. Um, then uh, another aspect that I think it's important to pay attention to, uh, ensuring that interventions that are carried out in the framework of the prevent stream are also gender sensitive and gender responsive. So uh, ensuring that these interventions are able to identify, first of all, gender specific needs, as well as addressing them. And that may involve providing gender sensitive um, counseling, mentorship, uh, support services, um, um, and definitely it could potentially be linked to different uh, diverse challenges faced by individuals of both genders. Now I have to mention here that when I say gender, I don't necessarily mean women's representation or women specifically, it's both uh, women and men, of course. And uh, finally, last but not least, of course, uh, community uh, participation of uh, women and uh, investing in uh, capacity building programs, uh, gender related capacity building programs for uh, frontline workers. Um, and finally, um, the very last aspect I wanted to mention is uh, something I've raised before, um, gender disaggregated data and the need to actually enhance current uh, data tools and improve data collection and uh, research efforts uh, to better understand the gender as gendered aspects of violent extremism and radicalization. So these are some of the aspects I wanted to outline and definitely I have a lot of questions uh, to the audience as well and the speakers uh, on gender and the potential integration, what opportunity we see and what challenges are there and whether there is indeed, whether it could be considered as a problem in the UK context because for instance, I had an informal chat with Ian just before and, and it is not always viewed as a, as a problem in the UK context and hence there is less attention to it less than on the maybe international scale. So yeah, thank you. Really interesting, thank you, thank you so much, Julia. Um, Liam, I'm gonna hand over to you now. The graveyard shift. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and I'm really sorry if you received about 10 messages or emails from me begging you to come to this event, but I'm glad that some of you took me up on it, so thank you. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, like, first of all, I'm really Glad. I think you know we all know that the Prevent review was published a little while ago, but um, you know if I, if I can say so, given that we're the ones putting on this event, but I do think it's valuable now that the dust has settled a little bit to to look at it and also to assess the challenges ahead from all the different angles that we've done so. So um, I hope you can agree that's valuable, and I hope you can agree that the conversation is not over when we do go into the Q and A, and you know there's going to be time for more coffee and pastries if you can if you can stomach it afterwards. Um, so. Final apology. Uh, I do think there's one or two people in the audience who heard me say, a I'm looking at one right now, who heard me say a variation of these remarks um, just this morning at a totally different event, and I'm not very original, so I'm going to do it all again. Um, so apologies to them. You can zone out. Um, but I'm going to talk about a few different tensions that exist in my own head. So um, again, with the caveat of uh, I said this morning, um, if it sounds like I'm kind of working this out as I go along, it's because I am working some of this out as I go along. Um, and obviously there were some 34 odd recommendations, I think, from the, from the Prevent Review. Um, not gonna go into detail on all of those, but I think um, the core takeaway really was that Prevent really needed to get back to that, that core business of preventing terrorism, of, of counter terrorism, of preventing radicalization leading to violent extremism and, uh, and terrorism. Um, and I do think that, you know, I was a bit out of the loop for a little while, um, but I do think that after kind of the 2014 to 17 years when we had the, the crisis of ISIS recruitment and migration and we had um, obviously an awful lot of very horrific attacks. Um, I know there's some people who were caught up in, in those attacks in the room today. Um, you know, we had, that, we had that and there was a kind of massive injection, a bit of a ballooning of, of and I'm not gonna call it prevent, like the extremism sector writ large. There was all sorts of new initiatives, new, new NGOs were set up, including our own to be frank. Um, and 
as kind of the ISIS threat and that crisis dwindled, I think obviously, and I don't mean this in a conspiratorial way, I think obviously people strive to remain relevant. Um, and one way that that happens is that people like me come up and sit on stage and, and tell you, by the way, the, the threat isn't gone. The threat's worse than ever. The threat's going to evolve into, into this new thing that you hadn't considered. Oh, by the way, have you considered this threat over here um, that's, that's actually you, wasn't even on your, on your radar and it's a whole new threat and we need a whole new funding incentive for it. And I, again, I don't mean this in a conspiratorial way. I'm not trying to be controversial. I think it's important that we're honest about that, that dynamic, that organizations and people are competing for column inches. They're competing for media coverage. They're competing for funding. And that helps to create that dynamic of mission creep. Uh, I think that's what we saw in a lot of a lot of initiatives over the years. Sorry, Lorenzo, I don't know why you're smiling at me, but <laughs> um, so people, so there is that there is that dynamic that we need to be aware of uh, in cancer terrorism. So I do, I really welcome that somebody kind of pumped the brakes in William Shawcross's review, I think, and you know did a kind of assessment about whether this is some of what's happening under the banner of prevent is actually relevant to cancer terrorism. Because like I said, I do, I do think there was uh, it escaped. You know, the genie got out the out the bottle a little bit. Excuse me. That wasn't intention. That wasn't a mic drop. That's coming. <laughs> um, so this is where I, I come to the tension. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and say thank you. By the way, um, I'm not going to sit here and say the the threat is worse than ever. You know, this, that, and the other. We need to be alarmist and things like that. Um, I definitely think that the terrorist threat from and I'm talking mainly about jihadists and militant Islamists here. The terrorist threat has massively diminished from a few years ago. And we need to be honest about that, and we need to be confident in, in saying that. Um, however, and I'm having said all of what I've just said, acutely aware of the kind of semi-self-serving nature of this, it would be really dangerous to take our eyes off the ball right now when it comes to the jihadist movement. Um, sorry, go to my notes. So, um, which is also linked to the second tension that's going around in my head, which is that in order to fully understand what's happening now, we need to think of the Having said, that, having said that I welcome that the Prevent Review is, is going back to the core business of counterterrorism, I think it's important that we perceive of and understand the jihadist movement as much, much more than a terrorist movement. And in fact, you could, um, as counterintuitively as it sounds, um, it's probably primarily not a terrorist movement. It's a movement which has existed for 30 or 40 years, which on occasion has used terrorist tactics or groups um, aligned to the Salafi jihadist global movement have used ter terrorist tactics, but that is not the bread and butter of what being a Salafi jihadist involves. It is not planning attacks. It is not um, calling for attacks against the West. Um, just to give you an example, um, I think next Monday marks 10 years since the murder of uh, Lee Rigby, um, which is just unbelievable to me that that, that happened 10 years ago. Um, but that attack, if you remember that, that was eight years after the 7-7 attacks. And a lot of the similar conversations were happening then, that, you know, is the jihadist threat still relevant? Um, you know, it's not, re it's, it's not a threat anymore. The threat has gone. And obviously Lee, Rig Lee Rigby was murdered, and then shortly after that we saw a trickle turn into a flood of Britons going to join uh, extremist groups in Syria. That's eight years between 7-7 seven, seven and Lee Rigby murder, and then, um, and then the recruitment flows to Syria. What was happening in those eight years? Salafi jihadists didn't just evaporate, they didn't, you know, the, the, the movement didn't just re you know, sit on their hands, and the movement still existed. The movement um, multiplied exponentially during that time. It went from networks of a few dozen in some places to a few hundred in some places. So when ISIS came along in 2014-15, there was a lot of focus on um, you know, ISIS's radicalizing potential, the unique propaganda power of ISIS to radicalize. I would actually argue, again, maybe this sounds counterintuitive, that ISIS wasn't doing the radicalizing. What happened was ISIS revealed the extent to which the movement had grown in the, in the 10, 9, 10 years. I'm, I'm glad I can see Rashad nodding to that point. Um, in the 9, 10 years, beforehand, um, again, going from, going from a, few dozen, a few dozen in some places to a few hundred. And this wasn't a process that happened largely online. This was a process that happened in, um, from study circle to study circle, from Dawa stall to Dawa stall, from door to door, knocking. You know, some of the same postcodes, some of the same streets, some of the same buildings were the places that supplied a lot of people to, to join ISIS. And I think if you, if you take that long view of jihadism, if you take that 30, 40 year view of jihadism and really focus on what happens between these flurries of activity, that's the bit you need to focus on. Because as, um, as Lorenzo's colleague, who's excellent academic, Hugo Micheron says, the, the attacks are the mo just the most visible symptom of the movement. What, ha what is happening in between? And as I said, I mentioned study circles, Dawa stalls. What the movement is doing on a day-to-day -day basis is living the fantasy of being a jihadist, living the fantasy of 
um, following, following the example of the prophet's companions. And this is an enormous challenge for a strategy like Prevent. First of all, because, as I said, we need to get back to the business of countering terrorism. But how do we counter this movement that isn't necessarily a terrorist movement, except for once every 10 years? Um, the, other, the other challenge for initiatives like Prevent and other initiatives is, um, John, you mentioned, I think you might have mentioned this term in your remarks, but um, they practice a princi principle of loyalty and disavowal. So how do we, how does Prevent, which uses um, local authority services and the education sector or health as an example, how does Prevent have access to people who have intentionally cut themselves off from society? And that's not a criticism of anybody who works in Prevent or a criticism of anything like that. I think it's a, it's a challenge that we need to think seriously about. If these people are intentionally cutting themselves off from society so that they can live this fantasy in between these bouts of activity, these bouts of attacks and foreign fighter migration, do we have access to them? I think that's a massive, cha a massive challenge for the next five, 10, potentially 15 years and beyond. Thank you very much, Liam. Uh, you've posed more questions than you've answered there, um, but uh, we'll get to the answers, I guess. Um, but thank you so much for that. That's, uh, it's, uh, we've actually some very distinctive uh, perspectives, I think, from our panelists and, um, and a lot of uh, issues that we can delve into in a bit more, more detail. Um, I might just start, actually, with this kind of cyclical concept um, that you've mentioned, um, uh, Liam, and, you know, the idea that the sort of the movements exist, the sort of extreme ideological movements, but the the actual threat or risk of violence or um, terrorist activities only kind of raises its head on um, on a sort of occasional basis, if you like. Um, and uh, I suppose trying to tie that back to what Lord Shaw Shawcross was trying to do in the review of Prevent and looking to the next phase, if you like. And, you know, I've looked in some detail at the response uh, from the Home Secretary and from government to, to the various recommendations. You know, how does that sort of, um, how does that reflect itself in the next phase now? So, you know, we've talked about mission creep. We've talked about kind of, you know, maybe taking our eye off the ball a little bit um, and becoming too broad in scope. So um, how do we not just refocus on the threat of violence, but actually, you know, penetrate those groups that pose the greatest risk? Um, and, you know, do you see that, do you see very tangible ways of that happening? And I, I'll, put, I'll throw that open to the whole panel. Um, so whoever would like to maybe raise their hand and kick off on that one. I can come back real quick. Um, yeah, I think, I, I, and again, I, don't, I won't just speak about prevent here, but I think there's a there's a uh, an onus on the extremism sector, if we can call it that. You know, academics, NGOs, think tanks, like you know, like ourselves. Um, unfortunately, I think that the reason I'm saying I'm saying that we need to not take our eyes off the ball at the moment is that I do think that the attention and kind of incentives in various different ways are pointed to other other threats, other other risks. Um, I think we really, really need to be understanding what is happening in those subcultures. Um, what, you know, what is the strategic reset? And John's absolutely right when he says that this is a, an ever-evolving movement. You know, we, we, we see them speaking in kind of um, eighth century terminology, but you know, this, that doesn't mean that the ideology is fixed. The ideo they they, they reevaluate. They evaluate strategic decisions, tactical decisions. The, the ideology morphs and evolves all the time. What evolutions are happening right now? And the problem is we just don't know because nobody's looking at it. And I think um, one of the reasons I wanted to speak after Ian is because perhaps a way that we can get a window into this is to have a look at what's happening inside prisons because that is almost like a petri dish of those um, kind of Islamist Sal Salafi jihadist subcultures. We, and the reports coming out of them are not entirely encouraging. We're seeing things like uh, Sharia courts. We're seeing things like... Um, we're seeing what I described, them trying as hard as they can from inside the prison system to live this kind of, I hate to use this word, but like this cult-like existence. Um, is, is that being mirrored on the outside? Is a really important question that we need to investigate. And I think people like ourselves and you know, other organizations need to be investigating that problem. We need to know, are they recruiting? Are they proselytizing? What form is that taking? What is the strategic res reset looking like? What will be the ideological evolution? Because there will be one. The, the, you know, the movement might, might wither out, 
but there will still be Salafi jihadists around and there will be an evolution and we need to know what that, what, sh what shape and form that will come in. It may not be a terroristic one, but it's still going to pose an a enormous social challenge. Thank you. Um, I, I think w we would all agree on this platform that uh, the right thing to do in relation to the Short Cross Review was to rationalise what um, Prevent did to stop it, stop the mission creep that um, Lucinda has uh, referred to and to be able to focus on harm and get away from a kind of safeguarding crash for sad and disaffected youngsters who actually ought to have been delivered a service much before they came under the, the microscope of, um, of Prevent. But the question remains, I think, what do you do if you rationalise, uh, prevent, focus on harm about the enabling um, subcultures that both John and Liam have talked about? And this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the missing P in the contest strategy, which for me is promote, which would go some way to, to doing this. Uh, and my conception of, a, of promote um, is rather like, John, your description of what's being done in France and Germany where there, there's a, you know, some very clear um, messages coming out from government about um, values and organisations that are antithetical to um, uh, Western liberal democracy. And I'm afraid, I think we've been completely supine in the last 10 or 15 years, by we I mean the government, in being able to stand up and, and uh, contest this space uh, and therefore allow these uh, areas, these zones of impunity to uh, emerge in the country. Um, where people are very much uh, detached from uh, mainstream British life. Uh, sometimes uh, that is willfully manipulated, that form of isolation, by people who uh, would prefer to um, uh, then promote their uh, extreme views and conspiracy theories and so on. But we haven't had an effective counter-narrative to that, which is why I believe there should be some kind of um, strategic overview led by government, which is very clear about challenging um, the, these narratives and, and it's also something about saying these are your rights as uh, somebody who lives in this country but your rights are entirely contingent on the responsibilities duties and obligations that you owe to other people and there has to be some sort of way of doing that in a relatable way that connects with people living in postcodes that are becoming more and more marginalized and isolated from mainstream British life which is why I'm advocating for a non-securitized approach like Promote, as I've described it very briefly, which will draw in other government agencies that aren't concerned primarily with um, a securitized approach, which is necessary but insufficient, which is why I'm glad, frankly, to see lots of people here from the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, because you should be leading the charge here in taking some of that lost ground back. Thanks, John. I, I, I agree. I agree absolutely with, with, with all of that and, 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 and what Liam said as well. <coughs> when I was doing the Muslim Brotherhood Review, uh, one of the people, interestingly, well, is it interesting? I suppose it is. Interestingly enough, who helped me was the late uh, Jamal al um, who who gave me a little book which had been written by, by two, maybe three, three of the surviving members of the Jihaman gang which had seized the, uh, uh, the Great Mosque in, uh, in Mecca in in 1979, although eventually flushed out with the help of French special forces. Their, <coughs> their, their, their induction uh, and progression in, uh, through, uh, through various forms of, uh, of, um, of Islamism, of, of Salafi, what actually was, we recognize later where was Salafized jihadism, um, was fascinating because there were so many different strands to it and it, it became a sort of ideological soup of stuff. So it was, it was, it was uh, brotherhood stuff, it was Salafi stuff, uh, it was Hizb al-Tahrir stuff, it was al-Tablighi uh, 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 stuff as well, all in, in, in the Hejaz. And actually, it had gone under the radar of the Saudi security forces, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to... to and this, you'd think in Saudi Arabia, of all places, where this is happening under their noses, they'd, they'd, they'd see it. They didn't. Fast forward to the Muslim Brotherhood Review, and I said, one of the things I said to, to, to David Campbell, what came out of the Brotherhood Review, was the need for a coordinated uh, and cabinet level led uh, effort in government to address the, the range of all these issues, which is not just about... So historically, of course, if you spoke to the security service, it may have changed, I doubt it, they would say, we're look, we're, this is out, outside our, our remit. What we're looking at are the crocodiles near us a boat. We're, we're looking at ticking bombs. The ideological stuff, the, 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 uh, the, the context out of which, uh, out of which these, uh, these threats emerge is not ours. The trouble is it belonged to nobody. Yeah. Nobody was looking at this. And it, it, to do something about it was, it was resource intensive because you would need 
area experts, linguistic experts, because you need to be able to read the languages in which people are, people are creating social media, the sort of materials they're putting out, and so forth. You need experts, subject matter experts. I mean, how many, when you talk about, you know, Lois in Disavowal, or Wallao or Barrer, which is, which is a highly technical concept, con uh, concept um, in, 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 in Hanbali, essentially Hanbali uh, law, you need to understand how that, where that came from and what it means in the contemporary context. And I, I think that level of expertise, especially when officials tend to move on, they do three, two, three years and, some, and then they go into something else. I don't blame anybody who wanted to move on from this sort of stuff because quite honestly, it does your head in. Um, but it's, it's, it is important. It, it, well, if we think it's important, if politicians think it's important, then you need to, you need to devote the resources and, 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 and build the capability to enable us to have a view across across the field. I don't think we do at the moment, and we certainly didn't when I did the Muslim Brotherhood view. I don't think we've, we've, we've done it since. I think this is an issue, by the way, across Europe. I think it's an issue in Germany, in Austria, in, in France, and so forth. Although they, 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 are, they, they recognize that they have a problem, and they need to know more about it. So I was just going to say that uh, David Cameron did articulate the, what needed to be done in his Munich speech, uh, which John will probably know more about than I do, but uh, it, it seems to be unfinished business, unfortunately. And may, and maybe, and maybe, the, maybe this business is never finished. I mean, that's probably part of, part of the, the character um, and the nature of it. Um, uh, I think Lee made an interesting point about sort of maybe misinterpreting the radicalization process. Um, and I think your point about, you know, it, it wasn't really ISIS doing the, the recruitment um, or the radicalization in, in circa 2014, the, the groundwork had been done. Um, and I'm interested maybe to explore that um, in terms of better understanding radicalization, which goes to your point about the resources, understanding the networks, having the language and the cultural knowledge, etc. Um, and Julie, I'm interested to hear your perspective on this as well from the, from the gender dimension, because it's obviously part of it, irrespective of which ideology, whether it's the, the far right ideology, the Islamist ideology, or far left ideology, it comes into it, I'm sure. So I just have one, one, one There's quite a lot of stuff out there. I mean, people did interviews with them, and, and they will talk about their background. And their back, a lot of them, a lot of them went back as family links or other links, certainly ideological links, with the, with the, with the brotherhood, or with the radical brotherhood organisation of the late 70s, uh, who had been crushed with hammer, so with the, with the, with the fighting vanguard. Uh, that journey. What we don't know is what happened in that journey from hammer in 1982, the crushing of the, of the fighting vanguard, through to the emergence. 30 years later, uh, they went underground in some way. So it's, it's, it's like the sort of, you know, the, the, the Gilles Deleuze, the, 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 the impenetrable um, French philosopher talked about the rhizome. They announced the rhizome. Uh, th these are like rhizomes. Mm -hmm. They go underground and then they emerge somewhere else and they get some form. Mm -hmm. on. Um, is it on? No. So for me, uh, regarding this question, what's more interesting is what kind of narratives and what kind of messages terrorist organizations use to recruit and to what extent gender plays a role in that. Of course, masculinities and femininities matter and they matter more so in, uh, let's say, the Middle East and the other regions where uh, with the more conservative attitudes. And uh, so to, to what extent is that represented? To what extent is that understanding uh, out there among frontline practitioners, individuals who work at the community level, um, not just in the Middle East, but also here in the UK. So that is something that I wanted to highlight. To what extent is, it, is that knowledge there? And I guess it's a more question to the you know, practitioners who are, who are here now in the audience. Um, I'm gonna go to the audience in a second, um, but maybe a connected point um, is around the role of communities um, in in the context of the prevent strategy and its rollout and execution. Um, so I don't know, um, maybe Liam, from your perspective, um, you know, 
what exactly is the role of communities and how involved can they be? They be? And I suppose historically prevent to some extent has been controversial um, because you know the the narrative emerged particularly in the early days that you know prevent was nearly about sort of neighbors telling on neighbors and uh, and so it became it became you know maybe a, a, a source of suspicion um, but of course if we're to have this type of knowledge and understanding communities have a really important role to play so anybody want to, to deal with that can I, can I really quickly touch on the radicalization thing yeah. as well? Um, yeah, just like obviously mentioned this before, but I think um, just like having this kind of one size fits all approach to, to radicalization, I'm not saying the people in the room do this or practitioners do this or prevent does this, but they're just the kind of in the discourse, this idea that, that, that radicalization is often like this kind of fairly time limited transformative process. Um, and also one that can be modelled out and applied to different extremist movements, I don't think that's very helpful. Um, particularly not when we're talking about um, jihadist movements, and again, when I talk about existing in those kind of cult-like subculture, um, enabling spaces, whatever you want to call it, um, I think it's, you know, it's not just an overnight transformative process or a slight deviation from being a liberal democrat. It's like it's you know, inhabiting a completely different moral universe and you need to see it like that. Um, and I've, uh, anybody who's read, read Jonathan Haidt's work will know that he talks about how you know, animals build nests for, for security, but human beings, we rally around symbols and flags and things like that. Um, you know, that's, that's what's happening inside these subcultures and that's the way you need to see it, is existing in a completely different moral universe to the one that, that the people in this room inhabit. And as, the sooner we accept that, I think we can get a better handle on radicalization. Um, in terms of communities, I promise I'll be quick. Um, communities obviously are a part of it, but it depends what we mean because there's a lot of things that get done under the guise of community engagement, which is just a very kind of slippery term. Like, for example, the, the controversies we've seen in Batley and Wakefield and things surrounding blasphemy, there's been, there's, been, there's been this idea that we must placate a certain community. It's like, well, no, we, like, Having a communities united against terrorism does not mean placating certain representatives that are absolutely not on board with that message. Um, you know, I think, I think and I, again, I, me I meant to say this, and maybe it's a bit controversial, but the prevent is, and people in this room are practitioners and in local authorities or police officers, are really swimming against the tide if we can't get basic things right, like sticking up for people accused of blasphemy, like a teacher or, a, you know, in Batley. Um, or, you know, local, again, sorry, I'm going down a controversial rabbit hole here, but, you know, police chief constables and chief inspectors and things like that are engaging with extremist groups under the guise of community engagement. But what, what hope does Prevent have of being successful for as long as that's going on? Or funding, you know, John mentioned, follow the money. If funding is going to obvious, you know, barely disguised Islamist entities, which is it's just happening across Europe, what what can any counterterrorism or counter extremism strategy do in that situation? It's just it's it's just you know putting to use an American expression, putting a band aid over a leak. Like it's it's you know until until we fix these basic fundamentals of protecting British democracy, everything else is window dressing. I'm afraid. Okay. Um, sorry, that's uh, that is that is um, a point that we'll come back to. We're, I would like to take some questions. Do we have a microphone in the audience? for circulating. Um, if not, you can take mine. <laughs> Does anybody have a question, I suppose, is the, first, uh, is the first point? Or a concise contribution from the floor is also welcome, because I think our panelists will be interested to hear. So I have two so far. Um, so do you want to take my microphone? I'll steal Ian's. And um, uh, this gentleman over here first. Um, a couple of people in the room know me, uh, particularly Lorenzo, uh, and a couple of others. But uh, my name's David Page. I, I live in near Birmingham, and I was a special branch officer until 2011. I think Liam touches on a point that we're all really rather shy of, and including Lord Shawcross in his report, is the politicians don't want to have anything to do with this except in an emergency and after a terrorist attack. And they therefore will not spend the money 
and therefore the civil servants who, whether they're in the Home Office or GCLG or whatever you want to call it, know <coughs> that there is no interest. There are no votes in prevent locally. And one of the things I found in Birmingham was the complete disengagement of any elected official. And I remember now rather dated because of my time, having a conversation with a group of young Muslim men in a friendly environment. They all knew I was a police officer. And the question I was asked was, when was prevent ever actually discussed in parliament? When was prevent actually discussed in the city council, which ostensibly are the people who control prevent? And the answer then, it may have suddenly changed, was no and no. We have got to make prevent legitimate, which is one of the few points I agree with all of the panel. This is profoundly ideological, and most people shy away from that. And with due respect to the people who are now practitioners in the field, the police are not the people to do ideology. They instinctively recoil from it, because I'm sorry to say, nearly all of them don't understand it, because they deal with something else. Thank you. Um, really relevant. Um, would you like to? Yep, over here. If I might be so brave, could I ask a number of questions and a bit of pushback, and especially against some of Liam's comments, only because he lacks controversy. Um, first of all, on two inactions, and you mentioned about promote. Do we have a bigger problem that we've got cultural winds blowing, which make it difficult to know what we really are, what we really represent? So if we talk to people who may be radicalised or vulnerable to radicalisation and promote certain values which they see are not being promoted by wider society and other groups as well. That makes that job more difficult, which means it becomes a civil society debate and not something the state or police or local authority can really engineer. But if civil society has vacated that space, then we have a real problem. Now, that's what I see as a challenge to something like promote. Um, Liam, you raised the issue about ISIS not recruiting. I would disagree with you on that. I think there were people who were vulnerable to Al-Qaeda recruitment who were not vulnerable to ISIS recruitment because the ISIS package was very different. The offer was very different. It wasn't just be a jihad and go blow something up. It was, we're offering you a lifestyle. We're offering you a place of safety where you can live and have a family and, and live and you know, get married. And so it's a very different package. And I think having territory, having momentum behind them as well, success tracks success, as I say. So if we read the case of Safa Bula, for example, she was entirely drawn in by ISIS rhetoric because it was, she wasn't vulnerable to AQ rhetoric before that because it's a very different type of rhetoric. So I'll say they did recruit, and they also, you're correct in that they did also take advantage of existing sentiment that AQ had created over the years. So I'll say both those things are true. But also, tactically, um, in terms of attacks in Europe or America, isn't that reflective of success abroad? So when, when ISIS have captured large pieces of territory in places like Mozambique and Niger and Libya, there's less incentive to wage attacks in Paris or London because we've got places to focus there. We're state building, we're the state building process. So it's more of a shift off to the, towards the near enemy rather than the far enemy. The far enemy has become less relevant given some of the successes they've had. Um, and to, sorry, Julia, to, to a question around the gendered aspect, which is really interesting, something we're looking at currently. The problem with that, though, is would we be accused of being stereotypical and assumptive if we started saying, you know, women or when men will have a special pattern of recruitment and a certain indicators, whether social or psychological? Um, and also, wouldn't that require a universal understanding of what gender specific needs are, which currently we don't have and we're nowhere near either? I'm going to take one more. Lorenzo, I think, did you have your hand up or did I imagine that? No? Okay. Um, one more over here, please. And uh, then I'll ask the panel to respond. And we'll have another round of, of uh, questions from the floor after that. Uh, thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about Islamist, Islamist extremism. Um, we're sort of skirting around the fact, and no, we're not, about right wing extremism. We had two of the youngest people ever charged with terrorist uh, sort of related offences in Rhiannon Rudd and Paul Dunleavy only in the last few years. I appreciate they both go hand in hand, but what's being done around the right wing side of things? Everyone up on the panel was talking about Islamist extremism and Slaffy jihadism, which we've been talking about now for 30 years. Where are we on right wing? Good question, which I was going to bring up at the panel anyway. So um, who'd like to kick off? Ian? OK, I'm not sure I can remember all the questions, but uh, I go for it. You, you certainly uh, set on a challenge in relation to this idea that's still mostly in my head called promote. And it's absolutely right. I do think the government needs to take a lead in saying in a, a clear, unambiguous and unembarrassed way that the, these are values, rights and responsibilities that we have an obligation as the democratically elected government to stand behind uh, 
and to spread uh, across communities that are sometimes very disconnected. But I think that, that's, the, that's the big picture, that's the, the big box. Inside that box absolutely are community organisations and NGOs. But I think unfortunately the pipe work has become rather disconnected where uh, I think Liam has, uh, and, and, and John have, have alluded to the fact that we have you know, actors, bad actors, who are uh, perhaps not violent extremists, but are, are um, certainly non-violent extremists that are you know, um, afforded uh, a status in relation to being interlocutors with communities that they, they do not deserve uh, and actually aren't doing us any favours. So yes, I think there should be a, a, a communi communitarian um, uh, involvement primarily in, in, in that, that idea of promote, which, I, as I say, is mostly in my head. And, and just to come back to the, the point that was being made in the end about it, uh, extreme right-wing um, terrorism, uh, you know, it's undeniably the case, if you look at the statistics, that the proportion of all terrorist defenders in custody, for example, uh, the, the biggest growth rate is with XRW. Now, I think if you interrogate some of those statistics, you will find that a significant number of them are much younger and they're being in prison for a much shorter amount of time, and the offences that they have committed are communications-related offences, being in possession of uh, items uh, that might be of use to terrorists or the glorification of terrorism, etc. They're not very sophisticated. So while I would absolutely say, for the reasons I tried to articulate when I was speaking earlier, that we must pay attention to all forms of extremism, because actually extremists learn from each other, apart from anything else. We've got an entrenched problem with Islamist extremism in prisons that has not successfully been tackled and cannot be tackled if you have prisons in the state that I described uh, in relation to those inspection reports, which, which are literally uh, took place last week. So we have a serious problem there. And I, I, you, I can tell you, you can take it to the bank, that the number of you know, some quite serious uh, neo-fascist, neo-Nazi, uh, right-wing terrorists that we have in custody will be looking at what Islamist extremists have done in terms of the competition for power, space and status in prisons, and they'll be looking to replicate that. That's a perfectly rational way to go forward. And to just finish the point uh, that, that you made, sir, uh, in, in relation, um, I think, to politicians, I've certainly been extremely blunt and Anglo-Saxon with various prisons ministers and uh, Lord Chancellors in the past, saying that if you do not pay attention to the violent extremist threat in prison that is not under control, you will be following a box with a flag into a church in the morning and you will be resigning in the afternoon if you've got any honour about you. Because that is the acute locus of the threat, so far as I can see. That there will be, and I said this in 2016, and unfortunately I was almost proved right five years later, that the prospect of failed jihadis in particular, who've been banged up for a significant number of years, for uh, you know, uh, upstream of the threat, upstream of the violence they were intending to commit, those people have all day and every day to observe... Agents of the state who are in close proximity to them, who are very lightly protected, there aren't enough of them, they're not confident enough to do their jobs. It would be very rational, in my view, to target those individuals, as almost happened in, in Whitemore Prison in 2020, where a prison officer uh, escaped being murdered by seconds and millimetres and nothing to do with organisation, blind luck, frankly, and the insanely brave reaction of his, his colleagues in that case. But that's where the threat exists. And your know, politicians need to pay attention to that. Because the next day that some atrocity like that, God forbid it doesn't happen, but the next day it happens, the rule of law will effectively have been broken inside prisons. You're not going to get prison staff who are going to go back into those high security uh, prisons after uh, you know, their, one of their colleagues has been murdered. It is a rational way to complete and to continue your jihad. Um. John, I'm going to ask you, because I can see you're jumping at the bit to come back, I'm going to then see if there are any further questions from the floor. And then I'll come I've got to come back on Gafar. I'm not letting him get away with that. Yeah, you, you'll get your opportunity, you but we have five minutes. So, John. Um, just uh, uh, the point about legitimation is absolutely right. One of the problems, of course, with Prevent from the beginning has been that it's been subject to a fierce campaign of delegitimization, I mean, irrespective of, of, of whether this is discussed in Parliament or, or, or in councils or in other fora. And I think you know it, it, it remains a highly divisive issue, not just <clears throat> not just in, uh, in communities, but actually politically. And I think one of the interesting things that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years has been the association of, 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 of Islamist uh, uh, movements with what we think of as critical 
uh, as critical gender ideology, critical race ideology, things that are associated actually with the, with the radical left, identitarianism and so forth. And this is something you, you don't really see in the Middle East, but you certainly see in the West, not just here, you see it in, in Europe and the United States as well, which makes it much even more difficult to, to handle. And it, it disables political will. Um, so the, question, the real question is, where does the political will come from? And I don't know. I mean, I, we, so you know, we, we, we're going to face an election. There's going to be an election in the next, next two years here. I mean, it looks as if Labour are going to win. What, 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 what's Labour's attitude towards all this? I don't know, to be quite honest. And I think one of the things is reinventing this, this whole issue, this whole, this whole strategy across governments. I mean, so far, it's, it's, it's persisted across, across party lines. Will it forever? I don't know. I simply don't know. On the gender issue, just very quickly, there, there was actually some very interesting work done on, on, the, on this, what, it was specific to what you've been speaking about in the Syrian context, in the, in the Iraqi context. Nelly Lahoud, a former colleague of mine, did a lot of work on this. Uh, there's a lot of work on, on, on the wider sort of socialization, particularly in, in, in the Islamic State, of Daesh, this offering of a complete package, which is basically you know, socialization value, uh, weapons training, sex, occasional violence, and campfire songs, which, you know, it, apart, from the, apart from the ideology, is actually what you get in the army, isn't it? Um, so th that was a very attractive package, uh, and it, it, it is a really interesting because because the gendering of roles in, 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 in organised Islamism is actually seems actually to be one of the attractive features um, for for women in particular and for men as well, of course. I mean, this is, but it's it's a, it's a fascinating subject. I feel a, a whole other discussion coming on here. It's um, there are so many aspects to this. Are there any final points or questions from the floor? Very quickly, please. Yes. Um, I'm going to try and be brief on this, Ian. Um, so we have, say, 350 young, young people from all over the world who are living in a very difficult situation, many, many of whom have come from natural discourses, which in our terms would be seen to be ideological. In your ideas of, of promote, can you see a way that prevent can then engage really positively with organisations such as ours so that we have a wider choice of not just refer or nothing? Because at the moment, the referral guidelines for our particular young people don't work. We'd be referring nearly everyone, nearly all of the time. Do you see that will work, or is that just too distasteful? Hold that, hold that thought. Sorry, which is your organisation? It's Big Leaf. Oh, yeah, great, thank you. Um, there was somebody else over here, I think. Yes. Um, probably a question for Ian. I um, wanted to ask a touch a tiny bit on the... Um, Resistant disengaged program and where you think it doesn't work. Um, I, I do agree, but it, it point one was it very much lies on the conditional statement once per prisoner or attack offender comes out of it. So they, there's a short window to do this. And um, what would you change it with? But you're slightly also mixing it with the prevent side of uh, engagement, which is consensual where it doesn't have a condition. So if you were to change it, how, what would you change it to? Uh, we have one final question over there, at which point I'm going to go back to the audience and I'm going to leave you to the last, Ian, because uh, a couple of those were directed to you. Cheers. Um, when we're dealing with um, local authorities, a couple of people have touched on the political will as to whether um, it's there. Um, with the regionalisation process coming in, which not everyone will be aware of, but means that funding is being removed from a lot of local authorities. Um, so there's going to be less people working in Prevent up and down the country. Um, we've got a lot of local authorities where there is no political will um, to even discuss Prevent, to say Prevent is even operating on their, in their boroughs let alone to talk about it positively or to encourage any form of engagement. What levers do you think there are for anyone as a prevent practitioner or anyone within the police service to try and change that picture? And the only other thing I'd say is that in regards to the point about gender and sex disaggregated data, uh, I'm, I'm fighting that one, I think, single-handedly at the moment in the Met to try and in increase that. Um, I'd love to talk to you about it later. Cheers. Great, thank you, thank you so much. And there will be an opportunity to chat at the end uh, informally. So, Liam, do you want to kick off? And we'll, we'll literally come back this way uh, along coming, the babe. panel. We, have, we are already a minute over time. So. I know, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Um, just to come back really quickly on Gafar, um, who I told you not to let him ask a question. But uh, I actually think we agree. Um, I never said ISIS didn't recruit. I said that it wasn't necessarily, necessarily them doing the radicalizing. 
And what you said about um, their package being completely different, uh, as in come and live and live out the life in the caliphate here, that, that is kind of what I was getting at, is that that is, that is what Salafi jihadists are much more interested in, is like going to go and live that, live that fantasy, if we can call it that, and live that dream on a day-to-day -day basis and go and live in the caliphate. As you said, launching attacks against people is not necessarily that attractive of a proposition. It's not necessarily what they're spending their energy doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I actually think we, we agree um, that the, the, the kind of the call to action is completely different and, and more successful in that way. Um, and Dave, just, just quickly on the, the right wing point, um, I would have talked on, talked on it, but I know nothing about it. I'm so sorry. Um, but I think what's really, really important is we don't go down this road of like all forms of extremism and trying to come up with, with models that you can apply to like across the board, like we need to, we spend a lot of time doing that, working out how extremist ideologies are the same. We actually need to look at how they're different and the specific specificities of right-wing extremism, you know, compared to jihadism. And I don't think, I'm not saying this is necessarily happening, but in the past, you know, we've tried to come up with models of that can apply to all of them. Um, and this idea that all kind of terrorist groups or terrorist movements necessarily follow the same life cycle, I don't, I'm skeptical of that. So I think it's important that we put the same level of focus into that, into understanding that problem as where it's similar, but where it's different from other problems as well. So yeah, regarding, uh, regarding uh, I would like to raise uh, or touch upon these two points on gender disaggregated data and uh, potential interventions that could be viewed as stereotypical. Well, um, I don't necessarily agree regarding that because uh, there are many different ways how to frame it. Uh, in terms of research, in terms of research questions, in terms of how, what are the goals and objectives of that, as well as uh, in all kind of interventions, as well as the referrals, I think there is a scope for a gender dimension. Uh, collect data collection, I don't think anyone can claim that that is stereotypical to, to look at the data from that perspective. What are the narratives, for example? What are the attractive points for for the individuals uh, who are drawn into extremism? What are the, for example, uh, certainly there was this uh, aspect mentioned now that there's a lot of work carried out in the Middle East on how, how what is the package and uh, for both men and women, and indeed for women it can be very attractive. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were women who left European countries to live in the Middle East, and marriage is one of the, in fact, one of one of the aspects that interested them. It was quite easy to get married, and although it, I see a point, it can be it can be perceived as stereotypical or against gender equality. But I think we should be a bit more open to that debate, to analysis and understanding, because this is how we understand first of all the needs. Second, we also understand how individuals were ter terrorists recruit and what narratives they used in that case. And so that's also my point regarding uh, potential research and gender segregated data that I think it's very important as a tool to understand and later on to combat those. And, and also to respond to the, if there is a certain terrorist uh, ideology and there's a program, how do we challenge that? What offer do we have? I'm not saying that we, yeah. we do like Saudis did in terms of uh, you know helping to organize marriages and, and uh, giving the money for that. That's not my proposal, of course, but there are many other interventions at the community level that I believe can be done, and I think they were done, in fact, in France. I've spoken to a few practitioners working with North African communities in France, and that issue is being discussed at the community level without any... Yeah any uh, accusations of uh, being stereotypical or being against gender equality. Yeah, thank you for these questions. They, they, it's easy to get married, and they had a lot of free home health as well. Um, uh, <coughs> I mean, the, issue, the, the, Saudi, the Saudi model is interesting because actually what really worked in the Saudi model is getting the families involved and actually uh, reintegrating them into, into a community which then provided antibodies against it, which is not possible in a, in a, in a non-majority Muslim society, I don't think. It was very distinctive, and even then, it wasn't as successful as they expected. Um, I mean, the two issues for me are the issue of uh, who owns this issue in, in central. It's an issue that, that Willie Shawcross talks about in the review. Essentially, who owns this in central government, and where, and and, and how does central government regularly commit itself to push back against the challenge? Because that's the thing we, which we that has been one of the major things for me that has been lacking in all of this has been a reluctance. So it, it's, it's treated, prevent is treated as a sort of problem child. 
If it's there, <coughs> it's important. We need it, but we don't want to talk about it too much. And I think that, that, you know, that, that, that remains the central issue. Okay. Um, Katie, to your question, full disclosure. Um, I think you run a fabulous NGO which deals with uh, unaccompanied minor um, asylum seekers. Um, and I think you deserve much more support than you get. I think there are moral and practical reasons for doing that. The moral reason is, of course, that you're dealing with young people with lots of vulnerabilities who have come from uh, probably traumatic places like uh, northeast Syria uh, and, and uh, bits of Kurdistan who've probably had extremely uh, traumatic journeys here and who've ended up in this country and are probably suffering from all sorts of things, including probably undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things that we know, looking to the practical national security point, frankly, about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is there seems to be a higher uh, preponderance of people who get involved in violent extremism that have th those pathologies that are not met. So there's a practical reason for uh, you being offered much more help than you currently get at the moment. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, uh, when this bar that most of the uh, young people that you're working for has been exceeded. Well, we don't want to securitize people. And that speaks to the point, sir, that you were uh, talking about, about what more can we do for uh, prisoners who are released from custody, terrorist prisoners. We talk about the reintegration of terrorist prisoners. In some cases, these people need to be integrated. They don't need to be returned. They, they haven't uh, got the uh, emotional and psychological and ideological equipment to live normally in society. So I, I think what we've got at the moment, unfortunately, is a securitized response to managing uh, terrorist offenders who come into the community. And I would call that necessary but insufficient. Of course it is necessary, and it's fallen down in its current iteration too many times to protect from uh, further harm. But there needs to be more than that. And what I would say, controversially, to, to finish off, is that we should treat... Um, convicted terrorist offenders much like we treat sex offenders in the community. And the reason I mention that is because there's a very good program that supports sex offenders called Circles of Trust and Accountability, which is all about getting trusted and credible people in that community uh, around the offender to be able to help them re or integrate back into society, to uh, find them somewhere to live, to provide a supportive circle and to work in partnership with the security services and the uh, protective services, including the probation police and uh, MI5 and so on, who are managing that risk. So some kind of partnership akin to what we do with sex offenders, I think, is the next stage. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to conclude um, this discussion by saying, I think, um, John, you summed it up well in saying that prevent is a little bit like, you know, the problem child. Um, we know it's important. We know it's, um, it's, it's there and it's essential, but... Um, sometimes we don't or policymakers don't want to talk about it because elements of it are complex um, and, and sometimes controversial. Um, so I suppose from our perspective as CEP, we do want to talk about it. We do want to engage with practitioners and policymakers, to your point, which is so important, to keep it on the agenda and to continuously scrutinise its efficacy um, and its evolution and how it's meeting the challenges, which are changing, um, as identified in the review and as identified by many of you um, here today. So um, just to, to remind you, I suppose, that the Counter Extremism Project is here and is a willing partner. Um, we have a lot of expertise, data, research at our disposal on our website. A lot of it is publicly available. Um, counterextremism.com. You're very welcome to check it out. We have resources on pretty much every terrorist group um, under the sun. Um, we have geographical analyses. Um, we have issues and themes. We have a podcast, which I happen to host, where, where we have explored themes um, like uh, Islamism. Um, we recently had a, seri a podcast series on uh, recidivism and reintegration. We actually have um, a program running which is free and open to anybody pr um, practicing in the area of reintegration. So please let us know if you're interested in becoming part of that. And we have a forthcoming podcast series on anti Semitism. So we really are trying to delve into these issues, explore them with experts, and share our, uh, our insights, intelligence, and analysis. And uh, we'd we really would like to, um, I suppose, propagate that and share that with you as, as practitioners.
I really do uh, apologise for running over, but I think it was worth it because it's been a really interesting discussion. And as I said, this is certainly not the end of the discussion from our perspective. It's very much uh, an ongoing one, and we look forward to engaging with you again. So please do feel free to hang around, uh, have a chat, and uh, we look forward to, to keeping in touch with all of you. Uh, thanks to the panellists um, for taking their time. Um, Ian, Liam... Julia and John, um, it's been really insightful, really interesting, but lots more to delve into. And I'd like to particularly thank our colleagues um, who are more in the background today, Debbie and Emma, for all of the support um, behind the scenes in organising and uh, executing this event. So thanks to everybody for coming, and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Thank you.